Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the monthly chart of silver, and uh, I've drawn in a couple of arrows here. And then the main thing we want to look at here is the uh, MACD. You can see that it's not just crossed over, but it's actually uh, starting to rise a little bit. It's a long, long way to that zero line. And you can see that this is unprecedented, but it is looking like a bottom from the long-term chart. Now, a lot of people have uh, said that, well, um, uh, silver's been in a bear market since 2011. Uh, well, how do you define bear market? Some people say a 20% decline is a bear market. Well, then that was a bear market, that was a bear market, that was a bear market, uh, that was a bear market, that was so. No, silver's in a long-term uptrend, but I wanted you to see how ridiculous the valuations are. You can see this arrow here, this is silver trading at a, basically the price that we're at today. And this was in 2006 during that spike top. Where were we in 2006? Um, you can see here on the national debt clock that back in 2006, around May, when that price was hit, the national debt was about $8.3 trillion. We're currently at a frozen level of $18.152 trillion, but we know this is going to jump to 20 and maybe even higher, maybe three times. So it's not unreasonable for silver to be at least three times where it was here. It, so silver should be already back up around 45. But we know that fundamentals don't matter because um, they're kicking the can down the road. That's what they do. But we're starting to see warning signs, and there are a lot of warning signs. So there's a lot of stories I'm going to jump through and, and just point out some of the crazy stuff that's going on. These are definitely warning signs of, of what's going on. Now, before I do that, I want to go to my comment that I put on the Silver Doctor's story. Uh, this is an SRS Rocco story talking about how 1% of the investors control 30% of the silver. We know how tiny the number of silver investors are, and we know that uh, Steve San Angelo has covered how much is being stacked. We, we covered that before. But I want to go down to a comment here that I responded to. And this is from Kiwi Surf. And here's his comment. Seriously, as much as I like Steve, this argument needs a comparison. What fraction of stocks and bonds are held by 1% of the shareholders slash bondholders? I bet a whole lot more than 30%. The other issue is that waking up doesn't translate into having savings to invest in silver. I would guess there are more than 10% of the Western population has woken up, but 90% of them have little or no savings to invest. I have a relatively high income, but it has not kept pace with living costs. My ability to stack in 2015 is a fraction of what it was in 2005. If the money is increasingly flowing to the oligarchs and the oligarchs want cheap silver to lull the sheeple to sleep, where is the middle class buying power which would break the bullion banks gone? This isn't the 1970s, unfortunately. Now, when you look at that argument on its face, it seems to have some merit because the middle class is weakening. There's no question about that and Americans are getting poorer and poorer. But this is my response, and I want you to think of these in terms of dollar values. And this is my reply. What a downright silly argument. What do Americans spend every year on? And let's think about this. I've gone over this before in previous updates. The gambling one, just the lottery tickets, and we're gonna look at the Illinois lottery story here in a second. Just the scratch off and mega ball lottery tickets is 71 billion. What do they spend on cell phones? Now, this list for me, this is discretionary income. In other words, these are wants, these are not needs. Do you need gambling? Do you need cell phones? Do you need tobacco? Do you need alcohol? Do you need soda pop? Do you need cable TV? Do you need pornography, junk food, plastic surgery, tattoos, drugs, Christmas, Halloween, sports, candy? How much is spent on these? Well, like I say down here, the answer is hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars. Think about it. It's not a lack of resources. It's a lack of knowledge due to ignorance and mind control. 
wake up. So the argument doesn't hold any water that Americans don't have enough money to buy silver. They're not buying silver because they don't have enough money. They're not buying silver because they're ignorant and they're stupid and they're, they've been brainwashed. And we're going to look at some of these warning signs here now that the system is beginning to teeter. We'll start off with this Illinois lottery thing. And this is really shocking. It's, it's amazing that in Illinois, they're refusing to pay out the lottery winners, but they're continuing to take in money for lottery tickets. And of course, free markets always operate. There are people who are addicted to lotteries. And I've covered gambling before. It's really a very simple pl principle to understand gambling. Um, the, the only question you have to ask yourself if you're gambling on anything is, do you have the edge or does the house have the edge? Now, obviously, in a lottery, the house has the edge. So in it, when you're in a situation where the house has the edge, your best bet is one very small bet. And of course, that's what you would do if you're going to play a lottery. But people who play the lottery don't do that. They do it because they're addicted. So here we have the story where Illinois is not paying out their lottery winners, even though they're continuing to take in money from the lottery. Two weeks ago, Illinois Comptroller Leslie Geisler Munger announced that the state would skip a $560 million pension payment in November thanks to the budget battle in Springfield. The news marked the latest embarrassment in a string of setbacks tied to an increasingly serious financial crisis that was thrust into the national spotlight in May when the state Supreme Court's decision to strike down a pension reform bid prompted Moody's to downgrade Chicago to junk. As we documented back in August, the state is in fact so broke that it's begun paying lottery winners in IOUs. The practice of handing out Rauner bucks instead of Federal Reserve notes was initially limited to those who won more than $25,000, but in the wake of the Geisler Munger's announcement, the upper limit on cash payouts was reduced to just $600. That followed directly on the heels of our prediction that anyone who wins more than a few thousand in the Illinois lottery can go ahead and figure on getting a piece of paper with Bruce Rauner's picture rather than Ben Franklin's in the foreseeable future. Now that Illinois isn't paying out its lottery winners, Illinoisans are simply driving to other states to play. And there's an article from the Chicago Tribune. And this describes how people are driving to neighboring states to play the lottery. So that's a warning sign. That's a big warning sign. And it started with their borrowing money from this pension, $560 million, that they're going to skip a payment into that pension. Now, here's a story on that issue about pensions. And this is about UPS pension holders. Some 8,737 UPS retirees could see their pension checks cut. The reason some UPS retirees receive their pensions from the cash trap, Central States Pension Fund, which covers hundreds of thousands of workers from different companies, reports CNN Money. The fund says it needs to make cuts in order to keep from running out of money, the network adds. A former UPS truck driver, now here's where the rubber meets the road, pardon the pun. This is literally the money we're talking about here. A former UPS truck driver who retired in 2007 after more than 30 years on the job told CNN that his monthly pension check of 2903 will be cut to 1452. So that's a 50% cut as soon as July if the Treasury Department approves the plan. Atlanta-based UPS, and it goes into the details. Basically, UPS has moved newer workers on to a, a different retirement. Of course, that's probably just a Ponzi scheme as well, just to expire later. That is another huge warning sign that we're already seeing retirees take 50% pension cuts. Absolutely shocking. Now, this is a story on Boehner and the debt ceiling, and this is an unbelievable story. They basically cut a backroom deal on this debt ceiling. Now, we know, 
I showed you on the national debt that they've had it frozen since March at $18.15 trillion. It's going to explode to a $20 trillion plus. Now, some numbers just uh, that I remember seeing were talking about um, um, an $8 trillion change. I did the math and did some subtraction, and it came out to um, the, the amount they're adding on to the national debt and the amount that they're bringing in tax revenues is uh, $800 billion a year for the next two years running. So the whole story about them reducing the deficit is a complete lie. And of course, you can see here on this chart that the national debt is in a parabolic rise. Um, it did not slow down with the fiscal crisis in 2008, 2009 the financial crisis, the crash, it just went straight up. The national debt is going up, up, and up. Now, uh, some of the commentators were were talking about what Boehner said, that the, and one of them said, Boehner is a liar. And I have to agree with that. Boehner is a liar. Uh, if Boehner said that the process stinks, but the alternative was a default, the bottom line is that he's just simply a liar. With interest rates set where they are, the percentage of the government's budget that goes towards interest payments is very small. Uh, it's, it's larger than it should be, but uh, with interest rates below 1%, we're talking about maybe two to $300 billion of the tax money that's taken in every year that needs to go towards uh, that debt payment. So... The only way you're going to have a default is if that you're you're unable to raise enough money to make a payment on your debt. Well, obviously, with the the IRS bringing in two to three trillion a year, then it's very easy to make a payment of uh, two hundred to three hundred billion dollars. It's only ten percent of what you're bringing in. There's no reason that you have to threaten default. You just simply have to threaten to cut. Um, as we saw here with the um, pension cuts, um, I would imagine that if they went ahead and cut their spending by 50%, like they're cutting these people's pensions, uh, there wouldn't be a problem at all. So this whole thing uh, is a fraud, and, and Boehner is a disgraceful liar. Uh, he, he is a person who has pretended to be a conservative, never was a conservative. Now we have Ryan, not a conservative all. Uh, at all. And by the way, uh, these people, for the most part, they're Catholics. Uh, they are fake conservatives and uh, they have nothing to do with representing the Tea Party or any other fiscal conservative. Uh, it, it amazes me that it has taken many Republicans so long to wake up to realize that the Republican Party does not represent fiscal conservatives. Um, it's ridiculous that anybody would believe that. So Boehner is lying, and that's another huge warning sign that they have to do this backroom deal to get the next uh, debt limit passed. They're keeping the budget in secret. They're not letting anybody know what's going on. Now, the last warning sign that I wanted to talk about is this story about SSDI. It was covered by David Stockman. But uh, this is the article back from 2013. And SSDI, if, if you're not aware, I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview of it. Basically, SSDI is a disability program that takes money out of the Social Security Fund. And this was initially something that was rejected for very good reasons but it snuck in and as we know, these types of government programs, they just grow and grow and grow. So we're gonna go down and get the summary of how this has grown and why it's grown. You can see the chart here. This is social security disability spending billions of dollars in 2013 dollars. So you can see that around 1990, it was below $50 billion. It's tripled from there, it's gone straight up. So let's look at the history and understand why the, the cost has gone up so much. 
soaring expenditures. The growing number of people on SSDI has led to an explosion in expenditures since the late 1980s. That increase has occurred even though the share of U.S. working age population reporting a severe disability has remained stable over the years. Furthermore, the share of the working age population that reports having a work-limiting health condition has remained steady over time. In In addition, medical advances have enhanced the ability of people with disabilities to function in many workplaces and the economy has become less reliant on labor intensive blue collar jobs. Of course, that's why it was created. It was created for people who literally were disabled, physically disabled. With this good news about Americans' health, one would think the ratio of SSDI recipients to working age population would have remained stable or fallen over time. Instead, as figure three shows, there's been a large increase in the ratio of SSDI recipients to active workers. This ratio has doubled since the early 1990s, which is a remarkable development. If Americans are not becoming less able to work because of health problems, why are the disability roles increasing? Economists David Otter and Mark Dugan note that the rapid growth of disability insurance does not appear to be explained by a true rise in the incidence of disabling illness, but rather by policies that increased the subjectivity and permeability of the disability screening process. Similarly, economist Richard Burkhauser calls the explosion in the number of people gaining federal disability benefits a policy-driven epidemic caused by rule changes that have made it far easier to gain entry to these benefit roles. Evidence of this stems from the fact that there have been large increases in SSDI applications when the economy is poor, as has been the case in recent years. As figure four shows, when unemployment is rising, applications for SSDI tend to increase, while a strong economy coincides with fewer SSDI applications. Marginally disabled people who could perform work may decide to try for disability benefits when employment conditions deteriorate. Indeed, a recent study on the work disincentive effects of SSDI found that, quote, employment of the marginal program entrant would be on average 28 percentage points greater in the absence of SSDI benefit receipt two years after the initial determination. And it goes on. It's an excellent article because it gives the history of the SSDI benefit program, how it's grown, and it's now gone to ridiculous levels where we're talking about things like alcoholism and mental illness and things that can't even be quantified. Uh, That's not why it was created. But of course, uh, once the government creates some type of free money program, it just grows. The number of employees that are administering this SSDI program is 65,000 at a cost of $3 billion. So that's another warning sign. Of course, all of these things are going to go bust. And I believe they're actually gonna go bust at the same time. But uh, when we see things like the Illinois lottery refusing to pay out the winners, uh, you would think that uh, you would pay out the winners from existing cash. Uh, that would be the first thing you would do, but not not government because government uh, is run by a bunch of morons. Uh, so you can see they're going to neighboring states. So there's a lot of warning signs, but the fundamentals are in place. Uh, silver is, in my opinion, about as low as it can go on an inflation adjusted basis. Uh, Just based on the 2006 price, silver should be around $45 an ounce. Uh, Silver at $15 to $16 is an absolute steal. Um, People say that, yes, that's true, but there's not enough people with money to stack silver, and that's just an outright lie. Uh, There are people spending money on all kinds of ridiculous discretionary stuff, I have no idea what people spend on tattoos. I have no idea what people spend on illegal drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and all these other things that are completely discretionary. So the argument that people don't have enough money to buy silver is absolutely absurd. But the warning signs are there. A crisis is coming. We just have to keep stacking. And we'll talk to you next time.